If you're new to Disabling Bias, uh, this is our LinkedIn Live that we run on a regular basis to explore topics relating particularly to disability and neurodiversity at work and in life. Uh, in this, we aim to share lived experiences from PwC colleagues and beyond and explore the work of organisations and individuals who are raising the profile of disability and neurodiversity. And really the goal in the, all this is to discuss empowerment and enablement and how we can disable the bias and the barriers that all too often are put in people's way. So today we're here to talk about neurodiversity and family. Um, we're covering topics like parenting and supporting neurodivergent kids, uh, how you protect your child's well-being and your own, and we're going to be looking at things like autonomy, advocacy and support. So before we go any further, I'm joined by two wonderful guests and I'd like to hand over to each of them in turn just to give a really quick intro to who you are and what you do. So uh, Zoe, if I could start with you, please. Thanks, Kim. Hi, Kim. Hi there. Um, I'm Zoe. I'm an associate. I'm a change management practitioner in the Operates Change Management Services. But I'm also a mum to two wonderful um neurodivergent kids who are um have brilliance but they also with their autism diagnosis both have communication and social interaction challenges and emotional well-being um, big difficulties and I'm, I'm delighted to come and join the show so thank you thanks for joining us zoe um and christina over to you yes hello i'm so pleased to be here my name's christina um i work at a wonderful charity called Red Balloon. Um, we are an educational provider. We're long established um, and been, been going for 25 years. And our real um, motivation is, is, is centred around inclusion and giving young people who are out of mainstream education a chance to um, feel included and to flourish and to, and to join an educational setting that, that works for them. Thank you. I mean, it's wonderful to be joined by you both. I know just from talking to colleagues while we were setting this one up that it's a topic that's so close to so many people's hearts. Um, so I'm sure that you've both got loads of really relevant experience and perspectives to share. And I wonder if we could just start with a bit of kind of almost scene setting and just kind of understanding a bit more about your experiences. So Zoe, if I come to you, could you tell us a bit more about your experience with neurodiversity in your family? So with my kids, they have always been exceptionally bright, but they've also been really hard to parents. They are uh, high energy. They are always, when it comes to, um, they're both now 11 and 13, and they are really lucky in that they've found themselves in supportive environments, but it's not always been this way. When we started with toddling groups, anything was happening. Generally, it was my kids at the centre, parents were coming up to me, uh, we were doing sports, my children were getting overwhelmed, other parents were rolling their eyes at me. It was a very isolating experience, trying to, uh, to do the best you can, because you know your kids have got so much to offer the world, but they're also very challenging in how they present externally. Um, because they are still kind of emotionally very young for their age, which is really, really difficult to parent as, as especially with society. They, they look at your child, they look tall, their expectations are that they should be presenting one way. However, they're in tears and they're sobbing, snot mm. pouring out of their feet. They're, um, they've got knocked on the rugby pitch, the mouth guard, the shoes, the socks, they're all, and all the other parents are going, what's that weird child doing over there? And you're just like, he's just got overwhelmed he's coping he is trying to self-regulate and you feel very vulnerable mm. um so uh, it's not easy and in school environments you kind of they come back and say i'm having to uh, um I, I to pay my best friend today to stand next to me in the playground because nobody else would stand beside me um my daughter was going through uh, bullying uh, and you talk to the teachers like, oh, we had the friendship chat today. And you're like, she's been excluded from every birthday party. What's this? She's, but then they all come to your birthday parties and you go, well, why is my child different? And then she'd ask, why is she different? But I was really fortunate in that I found a teacher um, at a new school who both recognised the new university and suddenly with resources and the ability to help meet those emotional elements, 
it's transformed her life. It's transformed my son's life. And I, I'm just so, after spending so many years in the wilderness by myself, being able now to be in a supportive environment now where I have teachers that support me, we've got advocates in the school. It's not just my daughter being best friends with different ladies, she's now getting the resources that she needs. And she is, and he is, the two of them, they're thriving. And I am so much happier as a parent. And it's just brilliant being in a place, PwC, where I'm able to meet other parents that are in the same situation and connect. And um, it's definitely that awareness and understanding. It makes such a difference to not only the individual's life, but the family's life and, and hopefully society's life. We're all able to raise awareness. Wow. Thank you, Zoe. I mean, some of those experiences you describe early on are so hard to hear. It's really clear, though, the difference that that understanding and the support that you describe, how that can help. Um, so, Christina, I'd love to bring you in. And, and how familiar is Zoe's experience to you and the work that you do with Red Balloon? Yes, it, it, it really is. Listening to Zoe's story um, it is something that we hear time and time again from parents that um, contact us um, and are referred to us um, uh, at Red Balloon. It, it really is a very, very familiar story. Um, young people, neurodiverse young people, um, it, this is a tough. It's a tough world to navigate. Um, it's a tough world for uh, teenagers and young people at, at the best of times. Let alone when 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 sort of the constructs are set up almost against them. Um, uh, that they're, they're making sense of this this sort of very um, loud and busy environment. Um, that they're, they're trying to second guess what they should be saying because mm. we are a society that that doesn't necessarily say what we're thinking, and that's not socially acceptable to say exactly what we're thinking. So, um, but the neurodiverse are so. Uh, is so honest they're so straightforward to work with they are so talented they bring um they bring pure joy to a situation when and to a school when they are um uh uh, you know when they have the structures mm. around them that work for them. So, so yes, this is, situation is, is is very very common for us, and and we have been able to develop. And I'm quite happy to share a few of the ideas and anecdotes. We've been able to develop de develop almost a structure where we genuinely believe that um, young people like like Zoe's um, uh, uh, children here can 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 really flourish and um, feel accepted and feel able to be their authentic self. Wonderful. And maybe for the people listening in who might be less familiar with the work that you do, could you give a couple of quick examples about how you work with young people? Yes, yes. So we um, we work with young people. Actually, our 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 school is a is a blended offer. So we have developed a provision that includes online and face to face um, uh, education therapy and social re-engagement opportunities. And we see those three as being really, really important, especially for young people that have had negative experiences in, in, in school. Um, and because of that blend, and by the way, we were doing this long before COVID, um, so uh, so that blended approach. Um, because of that, we we one of our one of the ways that we work with young people and get the best from young people is being able to negotiate with them and with their families as to what environment feels best for them, what feels mm -hmm. safest for them. How are we going to get the best out of you? what's worked best for you in the past what makes you feel good what makes you feel energized what makes you feel accepted and we'll negotiate the environment in which they work in the topics um uh, that that uh, uh that they, they follow now the, the the core skills have to be learnt um but how they are applied and developed and and, and uh, in education can all be negotiated to really fire up our young people so negotiation is important thinking mm -hmm. about the environment in which they learn and and the topics that they follow 
wonderful. And just listening to some of the questions that you described there, kind of such good practical, but kind of led by that, that kind of co-collaboration with the individual. It's really nice. And I think things hopefully that um, for all our interactions, like you were talking about in, in, in a society, kind of how we get along with others, there's something to kind of glean from that, I think, in terms yes. of how we adapt, how we understand the environment that people thrive in. Exactly. Want, yes, that's it. Yeah, I want to come on a bit to kind of um, some of your kind of core principles that you have at Red Balloon and also thinking about um, kind of advocacy and, and autonomy for kids because I, Zoe is a parent you're looking out for their best interests um, but also you know wanting, wanting them as individuals to be able to grow and develop so how do you how do you begin to advocate for your kids in, in that kind of educational setting do you have any tips or experiences? Yes, yes. I think I think step one is trust. Um, everything stems out of trust, um, and it's such a big word um, to say. It, it's not easy to build, especially with a young person and a family who are who who have quite rightly sort of developed quite a lot of mistrust over over the years um, of their peers and of education generally. So so trust. Step one is we build a trusted relationship, just one trusted relationship to start with. And, and, and we do that through um, sending um, what we call link mentors. So they're key workers, they're, they're adults that have experience of working with um, neurodiverse young people out into homes and to just very slowly build that trust. Very, very importantly, um, we do exactly what we say we will do. We don't overpromise. Um, we are clear. We set agendas for meetings. And that sounds really, really formal. When you're going into a young person's house, remember they've been out of education for many years, potentially, and you will set an agenda of what we are going to talk about. That sounds formal, but it really works in our experience because it helps them to, to have that understanding of what this meeting is all about and I think mm -hmm. that is a really important tip sort of in the wider world in the workplace in the home is that in any new setting um, it is to be really really clear as to what this is about and what that young person can expect to happen and not happen and then yeah. give a little slot for that young person to share what they want to share so it's not done to them it's done with them but it's super super clear so it's about trust it's about predictability it's about um a, a purpose so that the young person can really understand what this is all about and why is it important to me yeah very wonderful um zoe how does this resonate with your experiences and the support that you're kind of working through with with your kids it sounds absolutely uh, uh, spot on. Um, it's watching my daughter at Prize Day and the level of trust with those teachers. Like she's first year, um, and she, the environment that's that's around her is an environment where she's encouraged to be herself and celebrated for being herself. And the abs, the, the proud parent wasn't from sitting watching her getting. A prize. It was from watching how authentic she was. She was pure um, power, confidence, talking with her Latin teacher happily about um, history or uh, just happy to be herself with all those little measures in place, that element of trust. The, the dinner ladies, um, she built a rapport with them as French, but the trust that she's got with them and she compliments them on the food, she builds up those life skills. Um, and the, the importance of being able to support her ability to trust in the adults, because her peers will become adults eventually, but it's been giving all those tools that have allowed her to, to remain true to who she is and who, who she is as a person and not getting that getting squashed by society um, because she's got those mentors, those supporters that advocate her in, in her safe spots. It's, mm. it's just amazing just watching your, your, your child come, come to life. Um, and I, and I'm talking about one child, but yes, the other day I was at a, a leisure centre and I watched my child, the other child, quizzing somebody about um, just a series of questions. But that self-determination and that confidence, 
the maturity, but because the support is there from mm. not just my advocacy as a parent, but he, the environment that they've been built around has helped facilitate that self-belief that they can continue to be authentic to who they are and they don't have to have that mask up at all times and they will ask those questions. Um, it's brilliant to see and I, I just love how Christina's practice and her, her work is just helping our children develop those self-esteem elements because uh, as like massive hierarchy needs, self actualization happens when you've got your security, your um, all of your your pyramid in order, you can be mm. your authentic, a painter must paint, um, a, a, an advocate, a debater must debate, but they need everything in place. So it's just wonderful hearing the work that, that Red Balloon do. So yeah, just keep the good work going, it's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Oh, no, that's so good. And honestly, the things that you're raising, there's so many things I could touch on and ask about. I kind of, I love what you're, you're saying about trust and authenticity, but kind of really coming back to that environment for kids to flourish in. Um, I wonder, um, Christina, in, in the work that you do, um, you've spoken a bit about kind of encouraging voice and giving that space for negotiation. Could you share some examples of, of how you navigate this in practice with young people and their families? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I think negotiation and capturing student voice is, uh, are some real core principles um, that, that, that help everybody um, feel listened to and feel included. Um, at Red Balloon, we do that on every single level. Um, we do that around um, the topics that a young person will apply their core skills in. Um, an example being a young person came to us who um, felt very, very confident um, in certain areas and less confident in other areas. And an area that she felt very unsure about was science. Mm. Um, science is one of our core subjects and we encourage all young people, especially at Key Stage 3, to, to do some project related work. She was extremely turned off um, of the notion of, uh, 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 of science. She be begrudgingly came to the first session, but we'd had the tip off from her mentor who knew her well, that she loved space and she felt confident about space and astronomy in the widest sense. Um, and so the teacher very skillfully um, captured the voice of the students in her group um, some of them non-verbal, some of, you know, in de very, very different ways. And when I talk about capturing voice, I mean literally engaging with them and getting their opinion in very, very different creative ways. And the teacher had on the screen a number of sort of areas that they might be interested in and asked them all to give a, a mark out of five as to how interested they were of that, what, you know. And, and one of them, of course, was space <laughs> and yeah. astronomy. And so we were able to very very, very skillfully uh, put that out as, a, as an area of science, which she hadn't even twigged, really. <laughs> even though she was passionate about it, she didn't see that as textbook science. And we were able then to do that as the, the, the group then started with that. And she shone. Mm -hmm. And she literally came to life in that session. And not long after, there was an opportunity for some face-to-face. -face, um, uh, we, we actually went on a school trip to the beach. Um, she would never have come to that beach had she known that that science teacher would be on that beach, um, on that school trip. And she came along, met the science teacher. There was the connection. There was the trust. There was the, the mutual um uh, sort of adoration, if you like, of, of one another talking, uh, and and she really did go on. And and but sorry, and and just to finish off on that story, we were able as an organisation to facilitate astronomy GCSE, and so oh, wow. the word GCSE was able to be said in her. You know, the the idea of a formal exam was a million miles away until that connection was born, and she went on and was our first astronomy. GCSE candidate and passed exceptionally well. Um, it's a, such a success story and a, an example of, of where negotiation and, and getting to know the young person and responding to that young person's wishes and putting them at the centre really does work. Wow, no, that's fantastic. And really kind of being able to celebrate the uniqueness that that young person brought as well and their own passions. Um, 
I think, um, although we are definitely here today to talk about kind of kids and parenting and support, I do think a lot of this can translate into the relationships we build in the workplace. And, and with that in mind, Zoe, I wanted to ask you a bit, actually, because you are um, working, you're balancing working and parenting. What kind of support have you found at work um, and what difference has that made? I think the very first thing that I found about PwC when I joined was they wanted their authentic self, which I loved. I have been in other workplaces. I, I, I'm, I've always masked and PwC, by saying that authentic, we want to see the genuine person um, and we are an inclusive workplace. And that just that just clicked with me. And I was able to kind of open, open, my, open my eyes and just suddenly see how inclusive that workplace it was. Like the, they are, um, Edu they've got the inclusive workplace training, which is has just been rolled out, which is amazing. They kind of that's from the neurodivergence kind of autistic self to help other people kind of experience it. But as a as a parent, as an individual, the the celebration that everybody is different, everybody brings skills, everybody's this is fantastic with the um, the combination. And then we've obviously we've got our network, we've got a people network. Um, so yesterday I was on the, the People Network, the, the Belfast, meet, all the different teams were meeting from the uh, LGBTQ community, were doing work with that and kind of celebration of how many neurodivergents kind of identify. Um, the, we've got the Dawn, the disability in uh, a neurodiversity space, which we've got so many different people that can come together and connect. Um, I'm involved in the space, which is the parenting element of that. So every week, every uh, month, uh, we have a connection where all of us just come together. It's informal. It's a curious coffee. We bring our own coffees that I'm connecting with across the firm and we are sharing stories. We are like often the parents will come on the call and I'm having a really tricky time. And as PwC, we're problem solvers. We help solve. And you just see the all of us are all there helping one another and you just see the look of relief at the end of that one hour session as we've all kind of shared stories um we've got it's not just neurodiversity it's just it's just disability awareness elements but just having other parents who are fighting to get resources to get support to access medical consultants that they need it's just brilliant feeling that you're not alone you've got people around that you can yeah. bounce off and every month we, we can there's so many different groups that you can connect with and being connected and raising the, the profile, you feel you are connected, but then you're also aware of the firm and the firm celebrates this and they help inform everybody else who may not be aware of these issues, but you've got a voice, which I think comes back to what Christina was saying. You, you've got a voice and everybody celebrates and they want to hear your voice and your authentic voice. So it's a really um, amazing workplace to be in. I'm, I'm really delighted to have found an environment that celebrates individuality. So um does that answer the question <laughs> yeah absolutely i mean well obviously i'm delighted to hear that kind of as a reflection on on us and that but kind of i think more broadly that access to community and not feeling alone sounds so key and and i would wager that um pwc aren't alone in this and for others for other organizations find your community there are going to be people in the same situation you may have networks and just kind of getting into that group and to be able to share your stories. Um, I mean, I'm a member of some of our people networks ourselves and they do make such a difference to your experience at work. Um, we're actually, if you can believe it, coming near the end of our live, we only have five minutes left. And I did want to ask you both a couple of questions about uh, what you would like to see change. Because uh, we've been talking a lot about your experiences and the work that you do and what helps, but I think definitely as a society there is still sadly a bit of a struggle around this and kind of navigating that journey um we're not quite there yet so i'm going to come to each of you in turn and just ask you what would you like to see change whether in schools or society as a whole um christina i'll start with you wow um <laughs> at so many yeah this i mean obviously that question could be answered at so many different levels um i i would love um for us as a society to just improve our understanding of what a daily journey what the life of a neurodivergent young person 
uh, in education and moving into employment and all of and what that looks like on a day to day basis at the moment for our young person or for our young people and uh, and, and how we can make that so much easier as a navigable path, you know, and that's through education. I, I really would love us to be looking and, and seeking out stories from neurodiverse communities about how hard it is and what works for them. Mm. Um, and, and for us to take that as senior leaders uh, and actually do something with it. And actually change our processes um, so that everybody can have access, um, uh, uh, you know, on their terms, if you like, so that they can uh, live in an environment that that brings out that is is not fighting against them, but actually looking mm. to, to to help them be their authentic self and thrive. Um, it's a huge, it's a huge, huge. Uh, 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 ask, but it all starts with acceptance and education and, and understanding. Wonderful. I mean, yeah, I definitely couldn't have put that um, much better. Um, Zoe, um, to you, your thoughts? I totally agree on the education elements, and I believe it starts in education, but I think society needs to, to recognise the, the support that the neurodiversity comes, and that starts with education. That's, that comes with making the resources available at the earliest opportunity to support because as parents we, we we've had to become resourceful innovative determined all the skills that employers like because we are advocating for our children and that generally is access to like childcare, access to environments access to um the supports like in in it's in some environments you you need to wait um, until the children are at a certain level before they actually start getting access to, to resources like Chris, mm. Christina's. They have to be at a certain level. But if we all were fully supported from the grassroots up and the parents were able to support them, like, you, as a parent, you're constantly having to battle every stage. Like my child is transitioning from primary to secondary. I'm having to do battles again yeah. and gear up. And it's just, we're constantly having to battle to hear our children's voice, to get the support that they need so that they can be achieve their potential and I would love that as a society to kind of represent that and to um, to make it less of a battle for, for us yeah. parents because every step of the way like you, I, that is probably why so many of, of, of us uh, so few of us are actually able to, to contribute to our careers because we're spending so much long battling for our kids and advocating for them because that is uh, that's a full, that can be a full-time job in itself because yeah, absolutely. The amount of effort that you have to put into like this transition, like the paperwork's come through for my child to be next week. They've changed, they changed things, they're trying to take away resources. And you're just having to like, what? You've got things sorted, it's working, but you've got to fight again. So it's um yeah. So poor keep the education going, support the education and, and support the parents, don't make it such a battle. We were trying our best, but we need help. <laughs> No, thank you, Zoe. Um, absolutely. Make it less of a battle, make it less of a fight, uh, recognise the support needed. I, I think that's a really great place to end it. And, and and honestly, we could keep going, but we have run out of time. And there's so many questions I didn't get to ask you both. But um, I think just really good, clear tips coming through around how you can support young people you might be working with, give them the voice and the space to share what works for them, um, and but really build that trust and, and kind of allow that authenticity to come through. Um, I'm going to wrap up now because um, I don't want to <laughs> kind of keep people longer than we promised. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us and for listening in this morning. Um, you can find this has been recorded um, you'll be able to find the recording on YouTube kind of within um, the next sort of week or so. Uh, but you, please do share it if you found it helpful. Um, and this is a, a, a fairly regular series. Uh, I've just been informed it will be shared today. So look out for it today. Um, this is a regular series that we do. So look out for news of more of our LinkedIn lives coming on our LinkedIn page. Um, and in the meantime, you can also find the recordings of past episodes on the PwC YouTube page as well. Um, so thank you very much to Zoe and Christina for sharing your stories, your experiences, and most importantly, your time with us this morning. Thank you everybody for listening in and we hope to uh, have you join us again soon.